one day is going to be the day that I'm going to get myself in shape and I'm going to eat healthy. So when Monday morning comes, you get your packed lunch all sorted, do everything squared away. You know, you give yourself the extra nuts because you think you hear in Forbes magazine that that gives you the extra protein and protein delays hunger. So you're all ready to go. By Tuesday, there's no butter on your bread. And by Wednesday, the packed lunch box is out the window. You know, you're just trying to get out the door after running from a wife who's telling you to change nappies. You're just out to leg it. You know, work doesn't seem so bad then. <laughs> I know it only gets worse, eh? And it is, and then, so what happens in my life? Monday seems to be okay, Tuesday I start to struggle, and then Wednesday, I'm working in somebody's house, I'm working away in a woman's house, she's always coming along with a cake, and me being a sucker, you know, you always give yourself a million excuses that um, you've got to be polite to people, so you always take a cake. And before you have one slice of cake, before you know it, you come home, you demolish everyone's dinner again, and they're pudding, and then you're back for seconds. And then you think by Wednesday, well, you'd be as well throw in a towel, it'll start again next Monday. You know, and then you often, but as much as that's a laugh, the truth is that often that's what happens, is it? You always fail at that initial stage in life. And then what happens when you fail is a bit of guilt comes, a bit of shame comes, and you think, I'll throw in a towel and I'll start the week after, or I'll start the week after. But those weeks often roll into months, that roll into years. And before you know it, 10 years has passed and your life's in the same place, if not in a worse place than when you started. You know, and I was looking at a couple of firsts and beginnings in my life. And I would say that the beginning, the, what I thought was going to be the most important beginning in my life was when I was 18. You know, I'd just finished school and it was that summer. I just had an amazing summer. Um, I'd just learned to drive, so I was driving everywhere and I was going out play. Um, I was in a relationship with my girlfriend, I was loving it, life was going good, but more than what I seen, the pinnacle in my life, I was um, now starting to run well, I was getting Scottish medals, I was getting gold medals, I was going down to British championships for athletics and picking up medals there, and I thought my life was on top, I got the chance that summer to run in front of 20,000 people at the Crystal Palace Stadium, and not just that, I got to stay in a hotel, I got to go into coaches, I got to share the track with some of the best athletes in the world, um, people like Morris Green, Asafa Powell, I loved those things. That was everything I'd ever wanted. And off the back of that summer, I was going down to um, London to St. Mary's College, which is a UK performance for endurance running. I thought my life was going to be absolutely made. That every single day I would be at St. Mary's and I got to train with guys like Mo Farah and that caliber of boys. It was the greatest thing I thought was ever going to happen. But the truth is, when I went down there, it actually started to become the opposite. Here in Aberdeen, I was a big fish in a small pond, but down there, I was a very small fish in a massive pond. And when you think you're in shape and you're skinny and you're looking great, and then you stand next to Mo Farah, you think to yourself, well, I'm actually that fat kid, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and then it's okay when things are going well, but when things start to go wrong, you know, it seems to multiply by 10. And when I, when I was down there, I was, getting in, I was picking up a few injuries and... The teams that I should have been making, I was always wanting to go to the World Championships, and that year it was in Japan, and I was dying and dying to go, and then I should have been in a team, and I just had a nightmare of a race, and through this I actually pulled out a race, and I run away during the race, so my, ca my coach couldn't catch me, that's how much of a nightmare I was, and I was running, the race was on TV, and I'm running across the cross-country course, and my coach chasing me, asking me what's happened. <laughs> But life started to eat me up, and then I was missing my girlfriend who was back in Aberdeen. I'd been with her for... Oh, cheers, Stuart, man. <laughs> Stuart, I'll deal with you after, mate. And, uh, you know, and then when, you, when things start to go wrong in your life, what is it you normally do? You go back to the places of comfort, the places where you've picked up a bit of happiness before that you think was happiness, or places where you feel comfortable. So I started giving all my old mates a shout when I was in London and asking them how they were getting on, and... My mates were telling me they'd be all picking up jobs in oil or apprenticeships. They were making a bit of cash and they were drinking every weekend, having a great time, partying, different girls. And I was, when I was all there, all the pressure seemed on my shoulders. I just seemed so tired that I just wanted to go home. So what do you do when you struggle and you're a young boy? You phone your mum and dad. So I phoned my mum and dad and I phoned my dad and I says, Dad, you got to help us out. Is there anything we can do? So my old, my old man says this, uh, I'll speak to a few people and um, I'll see if I can get you a job. So I got an apprenticeship as an electrician, came home and I thought to myself I could be an electrician, I could run, still run for uh, Great Britain, 
I could um, go out partying with my mates, and I could live the lifestyle that I wanted and still live this successful athletics career. But the truth is that in a short period of time, my athletics career started to take a nosedive. Still won a Baker Hughes 10K during that period, though, so just remember that. <laughs> and uh, my, like, my career just started to take a massive nosedive, and I, to the outside, I would have looked fine. You know, I had a, a flat, and I had a nice car, and I was making a, an okay bit of cash, and I was, didn't look like I was down in dumps, but something in my life just kept on, felt like it was missing. There was a massive void in my life, and even athletics couldn't fill that void. There was just something. I'm a, I would say I'm a, a great believer that there are seven billion people in this world. Every single person is different. There's a plan and a purpose for every single person's life. You know, and I could never get My purpose wasn't it just to have a nice car or a nice house or to be an electrician or an athlete. I really believed that my calling was to make an impact in the world. And I believe that every single person here's calling is to make an impact in the world. It doesn't need to be a Nelson Mandela, but sometimes it's being that great dad or being that great mom or a brother or sister or a friend or that friend in a, a workplace. I believe everybody here can make a massive impact in the world. And that, as small as you might think that impact is, it is a massive impact in somebody's life. So when I was struggling, I was completely lost, dying to come home. And I was, came home going on well, and I was going out drinking, and it wasn't making things better. And you know yourself, you're always saying, I'm going to get myself sorted. Sunday, the day of sortings, we come to Sunday, I'm getting myself sorted, never drinking again. Weekend would come, out drinking again. I ended up splitting up with my girlfriend. So life now in Tars, and I always thinking, where do I start? How do I change my life? Because I'm always dying for change. But for all that period of my life, I'd always done the same things. I loved sport, same friends, same people. I, I, I didn't know how to change. And if I did change, I would have to complete. I would have to change my identity altogether. But one thing that always stuck out to me is that when I was 17, a year before I went to London, I was running in the Scottish Senior Championships in Glasgow, and I needed somewhere to stay. And I uh, spoke to my girlfriend, and her dad was in Motherwell. Her, my girlfriend was one of six kids. And my, her, um, their family, their mom and dad, had a marital split up. And the dad stayed in Motherwell with the three boys, and the girls came to Aberdeen with the mum. So I was well prepped before I went to stay with the dad, that the dad's a Bible basher. Everything's Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. And he's so intense, it's a joke, so you'll be under pressure for the start. And when I went to meet him, it was exactly that. Um, I could even picture it in my mind's eye right now that when you come into his living room door, his, three, his sofa there, the three-seater that watched on the TV was there. The boys were watching TV. He had his chair here, and I had my chair here. This was the interrogation chair. And any of you ever seen Meet the Fockers? You know the dad, Jack? Well, that's exactly what he's like. He'd spent all his days in the forces. He was in the SAS. So he's one of these guys, you know, if you lie and your eyebrow, eyebrow twitches, he'll pick it up straight away. You're just under that pressure straight away. You, you cannot lie. So you're dying to spin off, spin off any rubbish, but you know he's looking for twitches in your eyes or, or in the pupils. So as he does, there's no um, politeness. He says to three boys, get upstairs. I want to speak to Darren, so I knew it was going to be the Jesus talk. <laughs> but to be honest in life, I was never ever put off with those things. You know, I really appreciate when guys will speak honestly to you. And if you're ever in my family and my wife's uh, family, they're such a big family that nobody holds back. So if they've got a problem, they just tell you you've got a problem. And if you ever go to any of our family dinners, it's an absolute nightmare. They just battle and they tell each other their feelings and they fight back and forth. So I never had that problem with that. I'd always respected when people would tell you the truth. I think it's a great thing. It might hurt a little bit, but it's a great thing. So he sat me down and he told me his testimony and he told me all about Jesus and what Jesus had done in his life. And I thought it was great. It was the first time in my life a real guy had ever talked to me all about Jesus. For me, I thought um, Christianity was um, church on a Sunday, which was a guys in suits, hairs to the side, big Bible, wooden seats, wooden pews, and that when you came in and you sat there, that the minister would preach his boring stuff to you. He was more asleep than me, and I was already snoring. And you felt like that. You were already under pressure. You, I just, for the beginning, I never liked it. But when he spoke, I was really, really encouraged. I thought it was so alive. It was so inviting what he said and how it had impact on his life. But I was thinking to myself, the truth is, 
He's from Glasgow, so Celtic Rangers, they need God. He's had a life exchanging experience. He needs God, but for me, everything's great. I'm 17, I'm going out with his daughter. He's not going to really make a difference. I'm running for Scotland, so my life's all good. I don't really need God, but it was still a story that impacted my life. So that's why I'd always had that thought, but in the Sunday mornings, I would always think, how do you get from him telling your story to your life being absolutely changed? So you know yourself, you live a few more years on, live in disaster, and then you think, this is it, I'm going to hit a nail in my head. So what you do is when you're a bit lonely, a bit depressed, you call up your ex-girlfriend because she'll entertain you and speak to you. So I did, I spoke to her, and she was coming back to Aberdeen that day. She had moved, once we'd split up, she'd went to Edinburgh to go to university. She came back, me being me, I was going to win her heart again. So I decided I was going to take her out for food. We went to Union Square and I spoke to her and she started telling me all about how she had started going back to church. And uh, I seen this little bit of change in her, but I thought it's going to be a phase in her life because she claimed she was a Christian many years ago. So I thought, I'll, once I win her heart, I'll just go back to being the same way. And then just to really win her heart, I'd been making a lot of money that year doing homers. So I'd just done a a big rewire, a, a few grand, and uh, I thought to myself, I w what I'll do to really win her heart is I'll take her to Amsterdam, if I'll take her there for a new year. So we went to Amsterdam, and I thought there I was going to be the boy, I was going to win her heart, and everything would be romance, a bit like Hollywood. And I got there, and I just kept on, I suppose I would just start pouring my heart out to her. I just started speaking about the things that were going on in my life, what I was feeling, the hurts and the pains. I don't know why I was doing it. I never told her anything before. I come from a, a family that we don't really show emotion, so I, wasn't a re I didn't want to share it, but I was just spilling out my heart, and I would just hear this voice, not an audible voice, and I know what you'll think, in Amsterdam, he's hearing voices. <laughs> but it was the, I, wasn't a, I wasn't eating any special cakes when I was there. <laughs> but I would hear these things, t just as prompting in my heart and in my head, telling me just to tell my girlfriend what I'd done when we'd split up and things, and I was thinking to myself, she'll never forgive me for these things that I've done because to her they would have just been so bad and I told her these things and again she didn't accept what I said she was disgusted but she was hurt and she says to me could you come and speak to my dad again so I was off and I was away to speak to Jack but this time I had my tail between my legs and I was a bit humble you know so his story was now a bit appealing to me so back again and then I was must have been promoted to one of the sons because I got to sit in the three-seater instead of the interrogation chair and he spoke to me, and I started just, I just wanted to pour my life out to somebody, and I knew that he'd went through a marital breakup, and he would gave up his whole life as a diver offshore to look after his three boys, so I knew that God must have meant something to him, it must have been powerful in his life. So I went there, and I just started speaking to him and telling him these things, these hurts and my pains that were going on, and he says to me, he says, well, do you want to come to church with me tomorrow? And it's one of those moments you can't really say no, can you, because he's Jack, the girlfriend's three brothers are there, and they're there, so the expectation's there. So I couldn't really say no, so I went to church, and the church was a little bit different. The people weren't there in suits, they were in clothes like what we are in here today. But don't get me wrong, I still thought the men in there were a bit wishy-washy, a bit flaky, music was on, hands were in the air, I thought this is a bit weird, you know. When you come from a family, that, um, my dad's a butcher, my fa family working in fish and things, we didn't really raise hands and sing. You know, so when I came in, I thought, that's a wee bit weird. But I believe that when you're in there, you're in for a penny, in for a pound. And so I thought, I'm not going to leave here, and I'm not going to switch off until I hear the word from a horse's mouth, until I hear what God's word actually says. So I sat there in the row, and, this, and he was speaking away. And when he started speaking about God, it was amazing. When you actually hear about God's word, and he, even what we're singing here tonight, and you actually hear those things, and if they're true, they're an amazing concept that God loves you and all those things and there's a purpose for your life and all those things that you would die for you and that you can go on and live a life, a life of freedom, a life to the full. Well, those things were amazing. And when he was speaking to me, I thought, these are incredible. And my heart was beating at about 100 miles an hour. And at the end of the service, as, they, as we do at church, he came up and he gave his call. He says, if everyone bow their head and I'm going to pray for you. And if this is speaking to any, anyone tonight, could you raise your hand and I'd love to um, speak to you. And so uh, my heart's going, it's pumping, but I'm not going to raise my hand. I didn't want to show any weakness to Jack. I didn't want him to think I'm a bit of a softy. I think he's up against me to see how soft I actually am. 
I could see the three boys staring at me, waiting for the approach, the girlfriend saying, please just become a Christian. I'm panicking, but I thought, no, I'm not giving in uh, any weakness, but obviously, Jack had clocked my weakness. So when I didn't raise my hand, the first thing he does is he runs straight down to the pastor or a minister, and he picks up that I'm, tro- I'm uh, responding to the, about Jesus. So he gets a guy, comes down, and then the service, the old guy with the white hair, a minister, runs down the front. He says to me, can I speak to you for a second, son? I says, oh, yeah, no problem. Can I say no again? <laughs> takes, takes me down to the, his uh, seat next to him, and he says, can I pray for you? I says, aye, knock yourself out. <laughs> so... <clears throat> So he prays for us, and he's given it what he does. He gives my Bible up here, and I thought, ah, oh, great. But the truth is, I was just going to take a Bible home, and I was going to toss it in the cupboard like every other book that I've promised to read, you know. So I got home, and I just thought, no, nah, it wasn't for me. I'd weighed up the pros and cons in my head, and I just thought to myself, it's, I believe if I'm going to do this, it's all or nothing. That's the kind of guy that I am. I try to do things either all or nothing. So I weighed it up, and I thought, am I willing to give up all my mates? Am I willing to think that my let my mates think that I'm a bit of a weirdo? Am I willing to change things? Am I willing to go to church with these uh, flaky folk? Am I willing to do things different? Am I willing to admit that I'm weak? All those things were going through my mind, and I weighed it up that Sunday, and I thought to myself, this isn't it for me. I'm going to carry on my life that I've got. At the end of the day, it's not that bad. There's folk in a lot worse positions than me. I've got a job, a car, a flat. Everything seems to be going not too bad. But the truth is, I left two weeks to go by, and I thought to myself, the truth is, it isn't getting any better. It's just getting worse, and I'm still waking up on that Sunday morning thinking I'm just dying for a change in my life. So I never really knew what to do because, again, beginnings are so hard. Where do you start? Uh, Just walk into a local church, and how do I become a Christian? Because my girlfriend's dad had made it clear that going to church doesn't make you a Christian. It's the whole relationship with Jesus that makes you a Christian. Church is just part of being a Christian. But the whole thing of working out this daily relationship with Jesus is what makes you a Christian and it's what makes you a transformation. I knew that he read his Bible every day and I knew that he prayed for me and prayed every day. And those things, I could see an impact in his life. He was a man that stuck to his guns. So I spoke to him again and he says to me, son, if you want to be a a Christian and you really want this change, it's, it's a simple process. He says, you go down on your knees, ask God to forgive you, Admit that your ways were wrong and ask God into your life and, ask to, and say that you want to live for him now. So that's what I did. I did that on my flat in Torrey and I went on my knees. I'd always probably said prayers before, one of those SOS prayers. I've done something wrong, you know, stole my dad's car, crashed into the wall, taken it back and says, God, please don't let him, my dad catch me. And he never did, eh, dad. <laughs> <laughs> I grasped myself off when I became a Christian. I was getting my sins right. And uh, so I did, I went onto my knees that night and I prayed and I said a really sincere prayer and this was my decision that I'd made in my head. I said to myself, I'm going to pray this prayer and then if it doesn't work, then at least I can admit that him and his family are all brainwashed because I can admit he's Glaswegian, he brought up in a Catholic family and he's brought down our life experience, he needs God. So he can, and then he's got six kids, he's obviously going to brainwash him for there. So I thought, that's going to be the impact. So then I can say to them, they're all wrong. But if it does work, then I am absolutely dying for a change in my life. And I'd be so delighted for a change. I was desperate to do anything. So I went on my knees that night in my flat in Torrey. And I remember praying, just that prayer. I didn't really know what to say, but I just recited what he had told me to say. And I really wanted God into my heart and I prayed. And I expected just, I would say a Hollywood moment to happen there in my life. You know, you think to yourself, if you're going to get all involved and devoted to this cult stuff, you at least want Jesus to appear before you in a room or a feather from heaven because that obviously happens in the movies and everybody gets feathers dropped in their doorsteps. You know what I mean? So I prayed and I expected those things, but nothing happened. I opened my eyes after that prayer. I was still five foot ten. I was... (laughs) I'm five foot ten. Well, I wasn't, I wasn't until I got married and three kids. So I was still five foot ten. And I still was an apprentice electrician. I was still working in a building site. I still had the same flat in Torrey with no heat. And nothing had really changed. And I just went to my bed that night. And I woke up the next morning. And the only way I could describe it was, the Bible speaks about it being born again. You hear it saying, a born again Christian. 
And it sounds like it's one of those flaky, jumping about daft days. But all it meant was exactly what I was wanting, a brand new life. If anyone had that chance where their life's all full of rubbish and dirt and any junk under the sun and they're just wanting a change, what you would do is you would give anything up for a brand new life. And that's exactly what I felt like that morning. I didn't feel, um, I, oh, sorry, my circumstances had never changed. But the feeling that something inside my heart had changed that night uh, from that prayer. Woke up that morning and I still had to go to work. I still walked to work. I couldn't levitate yet. And I went to work and I didn't know what to do. But my girlfriend's dad had always said to me that when you become a Christian, he says, make yourself accountable to people. He said that it's important that you read your Bible and that you pray every day. So when I became a Christian, I was straight into the, the workplace. I was telling everybody that I was a Christian. And I didn't know what to do. I, I was too busy at nights to read my Bible. So me being me, I like to be a bit controversial. I like to have an odd Rami. And I'm very, very competitive. So I took my Bible into work. My, my girlfriend bought my, a King James leatherback Bible, which I still probably haven't read a word, but it looked like I was reading it. <laughs> and I was taking it out in my workplace. And when all the boys were reading the magazines then, uh, Nuts and Zoo and The Sun and the daily sport and things like that, I decided I wasn't going to read those things today. <laughs> I was going to read my Bible, and I was reading my Bible every day, and the boys were firing questions at me every single day, ripping into me. But those things I absolutely loved, because they made me go and research. Or, well, I really asked my girlfriend's dad. I was going to act cool and say I researched, but I've never done it in my life. Um, <laughs> <laughs> My, my, my girlfriend's dad's got a theology degree, so he can give me all the information, and you get, well, if you want to listen to him for about three hours. So I did, uh, I would ask all those questions, and I was dying for it, and gradually after a period, it was a new beginning in my life. I started somewhere, and to carry on that process, it took a, a journey of making sure I prayed every day, as small as it was, half the time I was praying at night, it was to, uh, to fall asleep. I was reading my Bible, just little bits, just so I could... I could answer the boys' questions and get involved, but every day, and it started making a gradual change in my life. And then when I started going there, that when I was doing athletics, I'd been involved for so long that when hard days come and I felt so isolated, I was desperate. The amazing thing is that when I felt now being a Christian, it, the only way I could describe it, the amazing thing was that Jesus was there with me every single day. I wasn't having to face those battles, the, the um, hurts and the pains every day on my own. I had a uh, the God that was there that would speak to me every day, not through audible voices or anything, but I would just read his word and you would get, you'd be praying about something and you would just open up with God's word and it would just seem, words would jump out of page, they would speak to you and it just went through there and it helped me so much. But the also other important thing that helped me so much when I was always wanting to give up and I still have days now when I want to give up. Some Sundays, the last place I want to come is church after I've had a stressful day a week. But the thing is, I'm accountable to people, and I'm in this church, and there's so much great people that help you and build you up and encourage you. And it was such a great thing for me that now that it's been eight years, my Christian life has lasted about three years longer than my athletics life, and it's been ten times better than it's ever been. And I'm so grateful to those things for God. And just as I finish tonight and pray for it, praying things, you know, every single person here, right, once a beginning of something, but every beginning needs a start, and I absolutely believe tonight, because it's Sunday, Sunday's a, day I, uh, Sunday's a day I start, going into Monday, that this is as good a day as it's ever going to get for you, and I believe it's so important, so if you need to begin, if you're going to begin, you need to start, and I believe this is a night to start something, you know, I believe that before when you've maybe tried to start something in a Monday, and you've let yourself down like me on a Wednesday when a woman offers you the cake. And if you're asking why I always say a woman, because when you work in a guy's house, he always watches over you with beady eyes. And if you're fortunate, if you get a cup of tea, if you work in a woman's house, she gives you a cup, a cup of tea and a cake, and you work 10 times better. So if I'm working in your house, cake, bake and roll in a cup of tea, and I'll fly through your house in no time. <laughs> but you know, um, as I was saying, it says, Good a day as ever. And then when you're struggling and it comes to that Wednesday, my promise to you is test God in his word. God will be there for you every single day. God will always be there for you. He'll never let you down. The only person that struggles is in your own mind because God it says in his word, he'll never leave you nor forsake you. And that's a great promise that I've always had in my life because as I say, when I became a Christian, my circumstances didn't change. 
my circumstances probably become harder now, trying to, well, trying to work a family home, trying to run your own business, trying to be part of the church. It becomes so difficult, but yet you get stronger through the trials instead of weaker when God's involved in it. I'm just going to pray for us tonight, and I'm not going to put anybody under any pressure or any situation, but you'll know yourself if you are here and you're desperate for a new beginning or you want a new start, because everybody's got to start somewhere. And God doesn't just put something in place or a little filler. He doesn't just give you what the doctors maybe give you, a couple of pills just to mask the pain. God gives you a brand new life. That's his promise, that when Jesus died on the cross, that was the exchange, your life for his, and he gave you a brand new life. And I promise you that tonight, that that's the promise of God, that he will give you a brand new life tonight. He will see you through it. And it's so important tonight to get, once you make that decision, to build on that decision. Get yourself a Bible. People here will love to give you a Bible. Speak to myself or speak to some of the other guys. Well, not me, I'll be eating my curry, but maybe some other people. <laughs> a person that's brought you along or Tom and Leon. Anybody that you hear that's a Christian would love to speak to you. Put a Bible in your hand. Pray for you, get you encouraged. And let's get encouraged on the 16th of April, which is my birthday. It's an alpha course, and it's a great place to get a good foundation. Because, hey, because you've got to remember, Stuart, nay, everybody's got a father-in-law like me, Jack. <laughs> he can't answer your questions. So we're just going to bow our heads. I'm going to pray for you, and I'd love to see you make a commitment tonight. <clears throat> Lord, we just come before you in the name of Jesus tonight, Lord. I know, God, that, I know God that you're a God of transformation. You're a God that changes lives, not just little bits, but you change us to make us brand new. Your word says that you came here and gave us life and life to the full. Not to live a life of sedation, not to live a, a life of limits, but a life that is limitless. I pray tonight, Lord, that if anybody's here, his heart is beating at 100 miles an hour. Or maybe they're thinking that maybe today's the day that I can change and Monday's just around the corner now when I'm desperate for changing my situation. I'm desperate to get a new life. I'm desperate to be one of those weirdos that stand and sing with their hands in the air and that set of freedom. I want that in my life. I pray, God, tonight that that people in here tonight would be bold and brave to take that next step in their life. If it's the big commitment of deciding I'm going to lay my life down for you, if it's going to read their Bible, a little start each little day and reading about their Bible or praying, or coming along to the Alpha Course in the 16th, I pray, Lord, that you do a stirring in here tonight. I thank you, Lord, for the great privilege it is to share my story, my story of transformation, Lord. And every day, my story to myself doesn't get boring. I love it every day, Lord, and it excites me every day because I know what you can do to me, you can do to every single person in here tonight. I thank you, Jesus, and I'm so grateful again. In Jesus' name, amen.